If you remember, last time we were doing the causes and events leading up to the Civil War, this uh, first part of the Unit 4, and I covered um, the differences between the underlying causes of something and the events leading up to it. Gave you those central questions. If you take a moment, maybe pause this and look them over and see which ones I've answered, which you can answer, and then which ones um, still remain. I forgot to start my stopwatch, so I'll be a little behind there. Um, so we focused on the South and how slavery began and how it became so central to the Southern economy and not just that, but Southern kind of identity. Um, and we'll pick up from here, slavery in the North. There's a cover of the book Uncle Tom's Cabin that we'll get to in a second. Um, so I think there's a, a kind of misconception about the North and the South and uh, the idea that the North was anti-slavery and the South was pro-slavery and also that the people in the South were bad people and the people in the North were good people. And I think that is... Uh, both wrong and a, just kind of a, a misunderstanding of, of how attitudes really were. Um, I don't think people in the North were any more moral or any better than people in the South. Uh, differing circumstances led to different situations and it kind of brought out the better or the worse side of human nature. Um, slavery existed in the North in the colonial era, as you know. And it died out in the late 1700s and early 1800s for a variety of reasons. The first reason was uh, what you might think, that in 1776, when the states declared independence, they, a number of the northern states saw the Declaration of Independence, the statement that all men are created equal, and said uh, slavery is wrong. And in the spirit of this new nation that we are building, we want freedom and equality for all. We're going to really live out the Declaration of Independence. And so that is definitely a reason why um, some of the states outlawed slavery. But not all of them. Uh, for example, New York kept uh, had a very vibrant slave trade going on, especially in New York City, for many years after the Declaration of Independence. The more important reason why slavery died out in the North is economics. Um, slaves were useful in the South because there were large plantations that needed lots of workers and especially after cotton was uh, became so important. It's hard to get laborers. We had a lot of land and not enough people. And in the North those conditions didn't exist. Uh, the soil was not as fertile. The farm sizes were smaller and it just made less economic sense to invest a lot of money in slaves. Um, if you had investment money, capital, it, in the early 1800s, it tended to go more towards building a mill or starting a shipping business, so trading and, and industry. And so the wealth of the North was not based on slavery. It was based on those other investments. And that's really why it died out in the North. This is an interesting question. Um, I would say the North was not that opposed to slavery. It's a very mixed answer. There's three general groups. The first were abolitionists, those who thought slavery was wrong and should be ended. They're actually a really small group. It's hard to know exactly how big there were. There weren't opinion polls at the time. But um, my reading of things is that probably about 5 to maybe 10 percent of the country would have been abolitionist. Um, Abraham Lincoln was not actually an abolitionist. Uh, I'll talk about him more in a moment. There were those who thought slavery, while wrong, should be restricted to the states that already had it. Those were called free soil people. They wanted any new states um, to be free of slavery. So that's uh, where the term free soil comes from. And Lincoln would have fallen into that group. The biggest group by far would have been those who were kind of unconcerned about 
slavery. Uh, they didn't really want it in their states, um, but they were happy to let the South do whatever it wanted. And that's a really big group in the North. Um, it, it's confusing as to why, if that's the most common group in the North, the North and the South would become so bitterly opposed, but um, hopefully I'll explain that today. Um, this is another kind of misconception. What did Northerners think of blacks? It, the, the key thing to remember is in the 1800s, pretty much everybody is racist. Um, racism is uh, just ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's a natural way that people viewed humans. Um, so m very few people would have questioned the idea that uh, whites are superior and blacks are inferior. Um, our, by modern standards, again, uh, somebody as progressive and advanced as Abraham Lincoln would today be considered uh, a racist. So the answer to that question, what did Northerners think of blacks, is almost without exception, most whites in the North would have thought of blacks as um, inferior. The scenes in the movie, Twelve Years a Slave, that we saw, I think were really good where um, Solomon is in the north, but I think they were unusual, that that was not the norm. Sectional conflict and balance. Um, sectionalism is the idea that each region of the country had different interests and um, kind of competed with each other for power and control. The South was the most strongly different from the other sections, and they feared that the North was out to get them. They feared this from the very beginning. When the Constitution was written, this was an issue. If you think back to um, the, the differences in opinion over slavery, over how um, people were going to be counted, um, over representation in Congress, um, those issues are there from the beginning, and they're very much a northern-southern issue. The um, issue of assuming state debts that Hamilton and Jefferson fight over is a north-south issue. Uh, where to place the capital, it, the south hopes that by placing it between two southern states, Maryland and Virginia, that they're going to have some control over the national government, and they fear too much national control from the very beginning. The South has to try to figure out a way within the Union, because they want to be part of the Union, to protect its interests. And they realize they don't need to win. They don't need to dominate the North. They just need to be able to keep the North from dominating them. And they can't do it in the House, because the North grows in population and becomes more populous and a majority of the House. So again, here, that issue of tyranny of the majority comes in, and how do you prevent the more populous North from taking advantage of the South, at least in Southern perspective. And the Senate becomes the bloc. Uh, as long as they can keep half of the Senate, they are kind of reassured that they can prevent the South from dominating them and legislating against their interests in terms of slavery, but not just slavery, other things like tariffs as well. So the Senate. Um, as you probably figured out, Westward expansion is the threat, because as we expand west, we add territory, we eventually add states, and that can upset the Senate balance. And that's going to be an issue for 40 years. The key decisions in the 40 years leading up to the Civil War are the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, and the Dred Scott Decision of 1857. Um, the Missouri Compromise is going to be the most successful of these decisions. It is going to hold the truce for 30 years. The Compromise of 1850 is going to kind of break it open and resettle it. It is going to kind of 50-50. It works and it doesn't work. Um, it preserves the truce for a little while, but uh, you can see strains are starting to appear. The latter two, the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the Dred Scott decision, are unhelpful and actually accelerate the push towards war and 
division. The Missouri Compromise. Um, let's uh, go on to this one. I'll come back. Before Missouri, the Senate balance is 11 free states and 11 slave states. And you can see them there from Illinois over to New Hampshire and then from um, Maryland and Delaware down to Louisiana. Missouri has enough people to be added as a state, and they would like to be added as a slave state, but that's going to upset the Senate balance. So Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, authorizes the Missouri Compromise. In it, uh, number one, Missouri is going to be allowed as a slave state. To match them, Maine is going to be created as a new state, as a free state, so it stays even 12-12. This area had been actually part of the state of Massachusetts. A third element, the territory above the line uh, at the bottom of Missouri, the 36-30 line, everything above there is going to be, quote, forever free in the Missouri Territory. So that's the Missouri Compromise. Uh, the great compromiser, Henry Clay, is the one who achieves it, and it uh, keeps the peace for 30 years. Sorry. It's going to be the Mexican-American War of 1846 and 1848 that's going to upset that balance. Um, in particular, after that, the gold rush in California of 1849 is going to upset the balance even more. California is going to get so many settlers almost immediately that it can apply for admission in 1850 as a state. Um, Henry Clay is by this time an old man and in his last great act uh, gets the Compromise of 1850 through, which is actually a series of several decisions and laws by the Congress. The first part is that California is going to be admitted as a free state. There is no um, corresponding slave state added in its stead, and so that kind of issue is now lost. Uh, but what the South gets are a couple of things. The number one, or the second piece of it, is they get that the fugitive slave law is strengthened. So when a slave had run away um, the, to a northern state, the northern states kind of just ignored to a certain extent uh, whether they should catch them or not. Now, the fugitive slaves law said it is up to these states to actively enforce um, catching and returning runaway slaves. And this ticks off the northern states. They don't like that compromise at all. They feel that um, they should not be forced to be accomplices in an institution that they don't like. Um, and then the third part of the um, Compromise of 1850 has to do with the District of Columbia itself. It are, um, they agree that the slave trade within D.C. will be abolished, but that slaveholding will still be allowed. And this compromise really pleases nobody. The Southerners are angry that the slave trade is abolished. The Northerners are angry that slaveholding is still allowed in our nation's capital. And they feel like that's a, a, a blight on the nation. The fourth and final piece of the Compromise of 1850 is this area. Um, the Utah and New Mexico territories are open to something called popular sovereignty, meaning that the people within those territories, or once they become a state, will get to decide. That doesn't become an issue here because those states are kind of dry and arid and not really suitable for large-scale settlement, at least at this time. So neither state really, neither territory really causes an issue. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is where things start to fall apart. Kansas-Nebraska Act is the third piece of legislation by Congress, and it is the brainchild of a man named the Little Giant, Stephen Douglas who is a senator from Illinois, and he wants to be president. Um, and he is hoping to get the Transcontinental Railroad to go from his home state, specifically Chicago, which sits right here on the edge of the, uh, Lake Michigan, to go from there to California in the 1850s. In order to get Southern votes for that, he decides to undo the Missouri Compromise. And so the Kansas-Nebraska Act... Um, passes legislation that says the Nebraska Territory and the Kansas Territory will be open to popular sovereignty. Douglas poses this as actually um, 
de democratic, that the settlers in that area, territory, will be free to um, choose themselves. What could be more democratic than that? And um, that is going to create a huge rift, especially in the north, um, over those who think that that's fine, especially those people who are unconcerned with slavery that I talked about earlier, are going to support that decision, and they are largely going to fall within the Democratic Party. And then, but di there's intense dissatisfaction over this because this is undoing um, the Missouri Compromise, and people like Abraham Lincoln are going to move to the Republican Party and form it after this um, to oppose that act and to say that Congress should not allow uh, slavery in the new territories. I know I'm over 15 minutes. I'm going to keep going a little bit. Um, so there's the little giant. He gets it passed. This is interesting, so I think you won't mind. Um, both the North and the South are going to take this popular sovereignty in the Kansas Territory and decide that, well, they are going to send enough people there to make sure that Kansas becomes either a slave state or a free state. A key player in this is going to be John Brown, who some of you researched. Um, Northerners, especially religious people from New England, rush settlers to Kansas to try to uh, get them to vote to make it a free state. But they're overwhelmed by a number of people from Missouri who cross over for a vote and um, those people are called border ruffians, and the pro-slavery settlers uh, actually um, win the first vote. The abolitionist forces dispute that vote and say that those people weren't actually settlers. They fraudulently came over from Missouri and voted and then went back. A congressional investigation uh, commission comes out and investigates and invalidates the election and says the real result was that Kansas is a free state. Um, the Kansas kind of degenerates into anarchy at this point. Each side sets up its own legislature in two different cities. Um, there's a free state or a slave state legislature in Pawnee and a free state legislature in Topeka. Um, President Franklin Pierce is uh, in charge of the national government at that time, and he actually opposes the Topeka legislature. While all of this is going on, a senator named Charles Sumner um, gives a kind of rabid, aggressive speech in the Senate called The Shame of Kansas, and he ridicules an elderly senator named Andrew Butler. Butler's nephew is a man named Preston Brooks. He's a congressman. He is so outraged by the speech by Sumner uh, shaming his uncle and the kind of dignity of the South, that the next day he attacks Sumner on the floor of the Senate with a cane. He nearly beats him to death. He beats him so viciously that uh, Sumner is hospitalized for months and um, nearly dies. Half the nation is aghast at this attack. Uh, half the nation is electrified and feels like Southern honor has been vindicated. Um, that violence in the Senate is matched by violence in Kansas. You get two months of skirmishes and battles, uh, and John Brown plays a leading part. He, um, his sons come, are some of the people who come to settle in Kansas to make sure it's a free state, and they ask for help. Um, some of the uh, abolitionists are very anti-violent, but uh, Brown is not, and he comes to uh, Kansas bringing help and um, goes to Potawatomi Creek, where uh, in the middle of the night they drag f some settlers out of their cabins who are pro-slavery, but had not been involved with any of the previous attacks and skirmishes, and they hack them to death with swords. And um, that launches a kind of low-level war where uh, the pro-slavery and the anti-slavery sides battle back and forth for several months, and there are dozens of deaths. And John Brown becomes hated by the South and a hero to the North. Uh, elsewhere in the North, abolitionists have been um, pushing their efforts for several dozen years. Um, and abolitionist, abolitionism gained strength in the 1850s. Um, 
most abolitionists are deeply, deeply Christian, and it's rooted in the idea that Christian or that um, slavery is a deep evil and morally wrong. Um, abolitionists also believe that the Declaration of Independence had promised equality to all men, and that the Constitution had kind of betrayed that promise. Um, some of the key abolitionists are William Lloyd Garrison, a newspaper publisher of The Liberator, and he is of the belief that the Constitution is um, part of the problem, not the solution. Uh, Henry Ward Beecher is an abolitionist preacher in Brooklyn, and he um, kind of pushes the idea that as a Christian nation, supposedly, um, America should be against slavery. Some of you researched Sojourner Truth, an uh, ex-slave from New York who um, spoke out for both women's rights and against slavery. Harriet Beecher Stowe, in some ways, is the most famous of the abolitionists because she writes uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. That book depicts slavery as this awful, awful um, <sighs> practice in the South. It's a novel, and um, it, it's, uh, I've read it. It's, it's kind of overdramatically told, but it's very popular in the North. At one point after, during the Civil War, when Lincoln is president, he meets Harriet Beecher Stowe and says to her, oh, so this is the little lady that started the war. So that's influential. Um, I think the most important and my favorite of the abolitionists is the man pictured in the background, Frederick Douglass. He's an amazing man. He's a runaway slave, uh, becomes very educated, and is, I think, one of the early um, examples of how Someone can live their life with dignity and uh, kind of confidence and power despite what society thinks about them. And he is a powerful voice um, for ending slavery, but not this, just that, for equal treatment for blacks. Uh, the fourth and final key event is not a congressional act, but it is the Supreme Court case Dred Scott versus Sanford. It's a shocking Supreme Court case. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the story. Um, in my notes here. Dred Scott was a slave. He was born into slavery in Virginia around 1800. Eventually, he's owned by an army doctor in Missouri. The doctor takes him to the free state of Illinois, but keeps him as a slave. And then they go on to the free territory of Wisconsin, which is free, of course, under the Missouri Compromise. Scott probably could have sued for his freedom then. He wasn't... Um, legal that he be kept as a slave, but he didn't. He later sues for his freedom when he's back in Missouri in 1847. And the case goes through several appeals where at one point Dred Scott wins and at another point the owner wins. Um, finally it goes to the Supreme Court in 1857. A majority of the Supreme Court is pro-slavery, appointed by pro-slavery presidents. The Chief Justice is a man whose name you should know. It's Roger B. Taney, T-A-N-E-Y. He's from Maryland. He is staunchly pro-slavery. The Tawny Court uh, issues a shocking ruling um, against Dred Scott, and it's sweeping. It doesn't just say that uh, he is not free, but it says the following things. Number one, um, the Constitution did not give citizenship to African Americans. Um, so Scott is not a citizen and therefore cannot sue. And it argues that slaves are not citizens. But not just slaves. It argues that all African Americans, even free blacks, are not citizens. That is, goes well beyond what anyone had thought before. So they can't sue in federal court. Furthermore, they say Congress has no right to regulate slavery, either in the territories or the states. It's entirely up to the states. So that's what invalidates the Missouri Compromise. In terms of impact, um, the Southerners are overjoyed. Northerners seethe. It's a key contributor to Lincoln's nomination and eventually um, Southern secession. Generally considered the, the single worst decision in the history of the Supreme Court. It's a stunning violation of human rights and dignity. Um, as a footnote, the sons of Scott's first master, his childhood friends, had helped pay Scott's legal fees through the years. After the decision, they purchased Scott and his wife and set them free. Dred Scott dies nine months later. Uh, I'm going to stop there.
and we'll go over this in class. That's the map of the election of 1860 that you drew for homework. Uh, just remind you of uh, the central questions. How and when did slavery become so central to the South? What arguments did the South make to defend slavery? Why wasn't the slavery issue addressed more adequately in the Constitution? Why did it die out in the North? How opposed was the North to slavery? What did Northerners think of blacks? What issue continually threatened the fragile truce? Why? And why did compromise regarding slavery become more difficult in the 1850s? I don't know that I've answered that last one for you. I'll, we'll go over this in class. Um, so be ready for this on Tuesday. See ya. Bye. That's a 25-minute lecture.